Tommy Reynolds has his gun out. He's pointing the gun. And all of a sudden, I see this woman. They say it's on every single station. They're saying that daddy died. I don't think his life ended at Holston's that night. If it wasn't for Sopranos, I don't know if I'd be here, you know? My first thing, and I'm with these legends, my De Niro. One night I jumped out of a car doing 60 miles an hour because I was addicted. Salute, Mob 2. Salute, Mob Tube. Today I'm going to tell you the story of Joey Coyle, a South Philly legend who was given the opportunity of a lifetime and blew it. So, Joseph William Coyle was born on February 26th, 1953. And at the time of these events, he was an unemployed longshoreman with a severe drug addiction. Joey was a high school dropout, but he was good with machinery. On the docks, they used him to repair the forklifts, and he was good at it. But at this point, it had been over a month since the union had called to give him work. He was in a very bad place in life. He was 28 years old and was living in his mother's house. His father had died eight years earlier from a heart attack after an argument between the two, and Joey was still feeling guilt as if he had killed him himself. On this particular night, Thursday, February 25th, 1981, Joey was crashing. Coming down from a meth high always left him feeling desperate and confused, and because he had run out of drugs, he wouldn't be getting any sleep. As the hours passed, Joey got more and more desperate, and the next day he decided he had no choice but to go beg his dealer for drugs. Joey walked down the street to his friend John Bailow's house and told him and his friend Jed that he could probably score them some blow if they gave him a ride. The three men got in John's car and headed to the dealer's house, but unfortunately for them, the dealer wasn't home. On the way back, they stopped for gas on Oregon Avenue and then took a shortcut home through Swanson Street. At one point, Joey is staring out the window. He sees a yellow metal tub with its wheels pointed up, and as he sees the tub, he tells John to stop. He thinks it might make a good toolbox. As he turns the tub upright, the lids open up, and out on the street spilled two white canvas bags. Joey pulls one of the bags into the front seat and sees a yellow tag with black letters that spelled Federal Reserve Bank. At this point, Joey says, holy shit, to hell with the box. Joey got out and dragged the second bag into the back seat. They drive away, and Joey takes a ballpoint pen and tears into one of the bags. In the bag, he finds tightly wrapped cellophane bundles of $100 bills. The two bags contained a total of $1.2 million. Holy shit, could you imagine? And by the way, it was all casino money, which meant that instead of the bills being in numerical sequence, the way it comes from the Federal Reserve Bank, these were bundles of random, untraceable $100 bills. The money had fallen off the back of an armored car, and this is how it happened. That day, a call came into police at about 3 p.m. The caller said an armored car had dropped two bags of cash, and Purolator, the armored car service, verified that the haul was about $1.2 million. A witness told police they saw a man who looked to be in his late 20s, early 30s, with thinnish hair, blonde or light brown, grab the bags and drive away in a maroon Chevy Malibu with the right front fender painted blue. Now, how does $1.2 million fall off the back of an armored car, you ask? A simple equipment malfunction. Once the detective who was working the case arrived at Puro Later Armored Car Service, he inspected the truck, and although the people there assured him that there was no possible way the doors in the back of that truck could have possibly opened on their own, the detective got in the back of the truck, the doors were locked, and with one swift kick, the right door came flying open. Now, at this point, Joey's friends, John and Jed, are worried about this whole thing and wondering what kind of reward they could get for turning the money in. Joey, on the other hand, says, fuck that, it's mine, and doesn't even consider doing such a thing. 
As far as he saw it, he found that money and he was keeping it. But after the initial excitement, he immediately started fucking everything up. He scored some meth, got high, and started formulating a ridiculous plan. Within a day or two, he had already told numerous people about the money and where it came from and decided to involve a guy named Carl Massey, who he believed was connected to the South Philly mob. He wanted to launder the money and get it converted into small bills so he could begin spending it safely. So he went to Massey's house with the money in a couple of suitcases. After asking Joey if he had killed anyone for this money, Carl then remembered the story he recently heard on the news about some money falling off the back of an armored truck, and he decided that he could help. Later that night, a man named Sonny had arrived at Carl's house, and when Joey saw who it was, he was in shock. He believed the man to be Mario Sonny Riccobini, a notorious gangster and brother of Harry the Hunchback Riccobini. Joey showed Sonny the money, and they came up with a plan. They decided that they would split the money into thirds, 400000 for Joey, 400000 for Carl, and 400000 for Sonny. Carl and Joey were to stash their cuts, and Sonny agreed to launder his 400000 through casinos, give Joey back 300000 in small bills, and keep 100000 as a fee. From there, he continued to get high, party with his girlfriend Linda, and hand out $100 bills to friends and strangers all over South Philadelphia. He also continued to tell more and more people not only that he had found the money, but in some cases, he even showed it to them. At the same time, the police are doing everything in their power to find this money and the men who took it. The detective on the case even went as far as having witnesses hypnotized to try and get more information out of them. Joey was fucked at this point, and he knew it. He spent his days in motels, getting high and pacing back and forth while peeking through the curtains, paranoid of who would get him first, the police or the mafia. For several days, the police and FBI were at a loss. The missing money was the topic of conversation on Philadelphia talk shows and in bars throughout the city. But then, the police began getting anonymous tips that led them to two longshoremen, John Bailau and Jed Pennock, who spent an entire day in conversations with police. The Maroon Malibu, it turned out, was owned by John Bailau's father, and after police discovered the car, John was ready to tell them everything. After four sleepless days of incessant drug abuse and anxiety, Joey Coyle reached his breaking point and headed to New York. He and a friend got a hotel, continued to party and spend lavishly, and on the seventh day, Joey made it to JFK International Airport. And just as he was about to board a plane to Acapulco, he was arrested by federal agents. He had 1,052 $100 bills or $105,200 in envelopes he had taped to his ankles. The police were able to recover $1,003,400, and in February 1982, a jury found Joey Coyle not guilty by reason of temporary insanity. Eight months later, he was arrested for drug possession and was in and out of jail and rehab from then on. Around that time, Disney stepped in and wanted the rights to the movie. They hired Mark Bowden, who had been covering the story for the National Enquirer, as a consultant and paid Coyle $70,000. He blew most of it on meth, but that part of the tale wasn't told in the movie. The movie was going to be called Money for Nothing, starring John Cusack. But three weeks before the release, and more than a decade after Joey found his fortune... Joey committed suicide and was found hanging in a stairwell in his basement with an electrical cord wrapped around his neck. He was 40 years old. The movie Money for Nothing is one of my personal favorites. And Joey's story was also told in a book by Mark Bowden called Finders Keepers. So that's the story of Joey Coyle, a man who literally found over a million dollars laying on the ground and threw it all away. I hope you've all enjoyed this story, and I look forward to discussing it with you soon. Everybody have a good night. I love you all, and until next time, salute.